series and many MR events are free and one of the ways we keep them that way is um, there are donations from the participating public. So if you have anything you feel you can spare at the end of the night at the end of the event, this is what we would like to create a so we can continue to bring these discussions into the public and give voice to the very thoughtful performing artists, dance with the base community that MR and also, we will make an announcement about the elevator. 745, just to remind you, the shots down. Um, and I think people want to move forward since we're the smallest room. Yeah. And other people might be coming late. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be shy. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. And now I would like to introduce you the curators for what? For the festival. Uh, Rebecca Brooks and Darren. Um, we're just really happy you're all here. <laughs> and it's really exciting that this is actually happening after so many months. Um, so if you're here for the first, if this is your first event in the festival, please come to more things. It's all interrelated. Is there anything else, Sorry. Yeah, the more you come to all the events, the more the, we can deepen the work together. It's about um, you know, people coming together and looking at things and, and being more into um, what we need to do. Uh, Hi, I'm Ursula Angley and I'm moderating this evening's panel. I'm, I'm sitting here with some really incredible people and I'm just going to ask them to introduce themselves by saying just their name. 
Mariah Weathers. Melanie Moore. Sabinda Hanzo. Morgan Vasquez. Alton Starr. Um, and Justine Lynch will be joining us a bit later. Um, she'll be <laughs> in that empty chair down there. Um, I have just two questions to ask the panelists to address, and then we'll open up conversation to everybody here. Um, the really big uh, idea that um, Rebecca and Daria have brought us here together today to discuss is transformation of society. Um, and the festival proposes that transformation is made possible um, through the interconnectedness of all these different elements of life, internal and external, um, somatic, political, um, and that, excuse me, transformation in one can affect transformation in other spheres. Um, so I would just like to ask uh, the panelists to please describe how they work with transformation um, and maybe what transformation means in their work, how they might define it. Uh, and if you also could use specific examples, I think it'd be really helpful to ground discussion. Um, transformation of society. Yeah, or just speak to how you work with transformation and how you think about transformation in your own work. Yeah, whether or not we don't need to address yeah. society yet. If yeah. Don't. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. So true. yeah. No, it, um, from the personal, just uh, what came to my mind as you just proposed it was that um, I grew up with a father who had Parkinson's and he's a movement disorder since I'm very little. So in my house, my mother's a dancer. I grew up in a dance studio. So there were these two aspects. Um, coming together, sometimes clashing together. There's some, um, uh, you know, somebody always moving um, um, in a non voluntary way or even called diseased um, in an environment that was about the aesthetic of movement. So I grew up with these um, opposing energies that kind of were blocking for a long time. I sensed a blockage within freedom of movement or my own expression until I started to make my own dances. And a lot of that came out that I've actually inhabited um, a lot of that movement language that I grew up with that was diseased in a way um, or um, burdened with pain. And when I made my first dance and I used it um, through imitation and then embodying it, it felt like a big uh, release or transformation took place from something in my childhood that seemed um, closed off in a way, becoming creative. And that was the first time that I had this realization of um, that that's what I am, that's what I'm interested in, um, the psychosomatic aspect of moving, of aesthetic, of um, how to be able to objectify it, to understand it, how to be able to relate it very personally, to understand it, and then to share it with other people and to, um, I've, I've done this, quite a long time ago, but I've done this many times in public or at movement disorder congresses with doctors and other people who have that movement disorder. And I could see that that starting from a very, very, very personal um, transformation can have an effect on a larger, um, a larger scheme. So that's my example. Um, I was waiting because I thought, okay, let me get this succinct and to the point. I could go on for a long time, so I really want to be careful not to do that. But um, I think that one of the ways that I think about transformation is that it's a passage which, once one has gone through it, there's no going back. So that unlike change or kind of simple changes, it's bigger than that. Um, and one of the main ways that I currently think of that is in terms of one-to-one -one small group and training work in somatics and specifically in a process called generative somatics, which is largely oriented towards reclaiming connection to the body and to life in the body, which most of us in different ways have been alienated from. I mean, I was sitting here just thinking about my clients, you know, I mean, for many years, 
because I've done kind of interpersonal work or training. I mean, I can say that phrase that probably lots of us drop with a lot of comfort. Oh, people are so out of touch with their bodies. And does this sound like a truism that you're, I mean, and yet to really be in the work of supporting people to make that reconnection, it's come home to me actually how incredibly true and that is and how incredibly devastating in terms not only of individual fulfillment and success or achievement or life, but also in terms of our collective reality. We would not have the social reality we do if more of us were actually able to feel ourselves and each other. So that's the primary way in which I currently work in this arena. And the little anecdote that I'll share, one of the programs that I work with is called Vogue, Black Organizing for Leadership and Dignity. And it brings together social justice movement, Black activists from around the country for training and support in reclaiming their reality. The first year that we did it, we had these wonderful leaders from organizations around the country. And there were a number of um, very tall, very kind of muscled Black men in the group. And one of the things that we do is a very simple process. It comes out of Aikido, but it's the place that we always start. It's the centering practice, which essentially has to do with just being in touch with sensation and from a place of sensation, finding your full length and dignity, finding your width and ability to connect to others, finding your depth and connecting to purpose. So, you know, trainers, cool, we're going to do this, we're leading the thing. And one of the men passes over and falls on the face. You know? And what we figured out is that this person, and this is a leader, this is someone who is out there in movement dealing with elected officials and police and whatever, and very much a presence. But it was someone because so much of his experience was about contracting the spine to not appear quite as big and threatening as some people would see him, that just in this very safe container, the experience of kind of relaxing into length, he actually lost consciousness. That's the power of the work, is to get at that kind of embodied divorce, if maybe the separation from our fully being able to live in service to our values, our principles, and our visions. That actually makes me think of what I would maybe in this context use as an example. Um, I recently did a year-long research on um, a kind of a embedded anthropology of the dance world. And so because it's a world that I know really well, I went in as a researcher. I didn't know that's what I was doing when I started, but that's eventually what it became. And part of my question became, why does creating dance together um, form family? And in a way that, not like family, you know, but like family in all the ways, what that implies, where you're kind of bonded to people that you may not even like, but you're somehow still bonded as you are with blood families often. So um, I did this year of creating dance performance. And, and it's like, this is, speaking of transformation, I feel like there's a transformation that happens among people when they're creating together. And then my thought was without words on some level. I mean, yes, there's lots of words involved, but um, so anyway, at the end, kind of what I started to think about, like thinking about the biochemistry of attachment is where I went after that because I work in the sciences sometimes. And so kind of looking at it from that perspective and then also from the extremely deep visceral experiential perspective, what I came up with was we pay attention to each other with our bodies. And we like, so the only other people you do that with are kids and lovers. So that you are nonverbal and observational with these people. So it sets off a whole series of cascade of reactions in our brain and body that we only have so far in this culture pretty much um, have these two, like your offspring and your completely your very intimates. But somehow we do that together. And like where you're very aware of the other person's physical needs and operation. Um, so I went into this whole thing about oxytocin and progesterone, but anyway. <laughs> So, but it's interesting because it's this idea that like 
there are ways that we exist without words that are extremely powerful. And I feel like it's within this context that we kind of, um, that there's like a secret within our practice that can be applied anywhere, you know? And, you know, as you're talking about, like, this doesn't have to be a dance that you do, but it's something about like how we transform our relationships within practice. <laughs> we're um, just addressing transformation, how we work with, how, how you work with transformation and what you do, and, um, how maybe you think about transformation, how you might define that. Transformation. I was just on the ride over here. I was thinking about some of the questions that were emailed to me because basically I'm living in, I'm actually really grateful for this talk because it brought me into like a new way of framing what I'm doing. And it, it's, um, it's, it's, the reason I'm late is it's like leaving a performance all the time when I leave this space that I, you know, have these doors open to. And it's this, you know, thing that's happening all the time. So the, the what I was thinking about was how, you know, it's like, well, what is art? Because if I'm here, you know, I was sitting here saying I'm an artist, and in a way, it's like I'm in this very mundane world of, you know, payroll, and I don't know, <laughs> paying bills and having people. But, you know, it really is, it's a great frame because it, you know, I was thinking about, what, well, if, if this is art, which I, I actually think it is tonight, you know, like Dario was actually saying it was, but I, I didn't really, I was like, yeah, nah, this is just, you know, some kind of hell that created. Um, Can you just beautiful. describe what you're I'm doing sorry, a little yeah. for just some of the people who might not know. So um, I, uh, my husband and I are acupuncturists, and um, I've been a dancer for a really long time, and the work that we do is, um, is very much in the realm of what um, you both were talking about intimacy and transformation and um, through a particular tradition of acupuncture and we thought it would be a good idea to sort of bring everything that speaks to us or moves us in some way into one place and we called it mountain and it's in crown heights and it's um, healing food a lot of healing services it has a classroom that could be a performance space or a rehearsal space um, it has a lot of potential right now, but it's really just been birthed. Like it's the last three months, uh, we've been open, and it, it's um, it's none of those. You know, it, it, I think it's it's basically really like work from here, not from up here. Like it's just so transformation in that way of like giving birth, like ripping yourself. You know, you don't really all the rhythms are off. You don't really care about all these things you used to think were important. So, in that way, it's like performance, you know, like everything just with life. Um, and so it's really neat to sit and like actually reflect upon it. And what I was coming to was that this idea of art is really, you know, well, if art could be something connected to mountain, and then if we're looking at, I don't, I'll try and make this succinct, but if we're looking at, um, reflection or reflecting on something and reflecting on the way art is basically a reflection of both life and death or those processes of the life force or you know healing and art have some relationship it has something to do with the life force and trans how the the flower of transformation or of a life could be creative but then at the same time art has to also incorporate death so it's like the annihilation of all the things we're attached to or the decomposition of our body or the decomposition of the score or you know what it is to be sort of for me sitting in this place where this thing that we put everything into could completely fall apart and we don't know if you don't know if it's going to live or not and so it's at, it's really at a meeting point between life and death always and so that's just what i was going to talk about <laughs> um, I guess this conversation I'm feeling is like transformation.
motivation is an uh, unstoppable impulse. If there's something that happens in life that we want to, that life wants to complete itself, and that we find refuges for transformation everywhere. And of course, we are very like, often at least me, we're like, oh, my refuge is the right refuge, whether it's like we find it in social movements. Oh, this is the refuge where we can actually protest the conditions of premature death. And that's happening right now in Ferguson, it's happening in Palestine, it's happening, I think, across the globe right, right now. There's a scholar, Ruthie Gilmore, who talks about the definition of racism as systemic premature death. And so there's an impulse to live. Like there's an impulse to have life be able to complete itself and not be cut short by the forces of white supremacy, the forces of capitalism. And then I feel like there's the impulse to, to make art, which is also the same impulse. You know, the same impulse to have life complete itself and the same impulse in healing work, which is to have aliveness be able to move and flow according to its own rhythms, not according to the logic of capital or the dehumanizing systems that we inherit and continue to participate in and then use each other and ourselves. So there's something about transformation that feels like it just keeps keeps on kicking. Um, and Alex and I are, are practitioners and teachers in the same tradition lineage called generative somatics. And I wear a hat both as a theater maker and as a community organizer. Um, and I want to share um, in an organization that I worked with in San Francisco called Community United Against Violence, CUAG, um, we worked with low-income LGBT, queer and transgender survivors of intimate violence um, and police violence and hate violence. And uh, the, I'm trying to think about how to, how to talk about transformation as not something that can be taken away from us or given to us, but an innate and inherent capacity, desire, or direction. Like that's the direction we move in. And there's something that, to me, happens where uh, we are born into systems that say, and right now in this historical moment, that ask us to deny our wisdom. Like that's the that's the test. Is like, please hide everything you, you truly know about yourself in the world, um, including what's wrong, what's not working, and buy into a certain kind of false reality. You know, W. B. Du Bois talked about this double consciousness. You know, different communities depending on our relationship to power, we have different kinds of investments in saying, yeah, this is right. I'm just going to keep going with the status quo. You know, for example, right now with the police, we're saying, no, police are fundamentally a good. It's just about one individual bad police officer. You know, we continue, like, this, you know, home, in my hometown over Thanksgiving, there's a certain kind of story that says, no, the, the police are still doing good job. They're doing a good job. The police are still fundamentally protecting safety, taking care of safety. And then if we look at the mass resistance and protests right now, there's a different kind of common sense that's coming up that says, no, that's not true. That's not true. Like, what? that's not true. The police are actually functioning in a fundamentally violent capacity. And that, to me, is evidence of transformation. That's like the transformational impulse that can or can't be squelched. Briefly, at this organization in Kuaf, uh, in San Francisco, one of the things we would do is we, we would um, talk about our individual experiences of, of that have that reflected to us, which I think it happens in art, it happens in healing, it happens in organizing. Like we're a part of a collective. And so we're responsible to each other. And there's an impulse that wants to move through the collective to transform. And are, are we open to that? <coughs> Let's see. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, this has been this is incredible just to hear what each of you have to say. And I've been sitting here like racking my brains like, 
okay, how am I transforming the world in my work? And, you know, um, and actually what I keep coming back to Collected back to me. And, um, you know, and I think for me, finding my way into dance and learning how to be in my body, they, you know, that, that was my transformation. That was how I found my own sense of humanity. Um, and and it, it validated the fact that I existed, you know, because in many ways, I didn't actually know I existed until much later in my life. Um, and you know, and, and, and so I think that the phys a physical practice and being in my body and then learning what you were talking about to connect to other people in a physical way. So it didn't rely on language. It didn't rely on a, a certain type of need of understanding. Um, and there was a protection, I think, also in terms of the, the danger of words and language. Um, that spoken, that I, I was able to create a safe, a safety net around myself or a protective barrier through um, going in. So in an internal way, but also in a physical way. And you were talking about finding your aliveness. And I think for me, that that, became, that was a necessity. It was an imperative. Um, and, you know, it's been a journey through, through dance and performing. And, um, you know, I think it's, for me, and I think for many of the artists who have had the privilege to work with, there is that sense of constant transformation. Um, you know that it's not it's not about what's comfortable. You know it, the questions that we're asking and the way that we're trying to show up in the world. I think many of us people who would choose to be part of this conversation and commit their their lives to doing work on this level. Um, you know, so I think it's it's being willing to stick through the discomfort and, um, you know, kind of persevere and maybe not even know the, sometimes what the questions are, you know, and and I think a, a, a trusting of intuition of something that's, that's beyond language. Um, so I think, you know, part of why I, I always have trouble answering about talking about this idea of my work is because I've primarily been a dancer. So I've been a body in other people's work, um, you know, and that sense of authorship and what is my work and what can I claim as mine and, you know, how my voice influences that. Um, but I think, you know, for me, my work within other people's work is how I show up and uh, bring the challenge for me. And I'm sure that many people can relate to this, but for me personally and bringing all the parts of myself to the work that I do, you know, being female, being black, being queer, being this, being that, you know, like all of these things and like how I occupy space, you know, and like every time I, I step out, I feel like, you know, I have to carve that and claim that and reshuffle it and, you know, to make sense of it for myself and also just how we all have to navigate so um, I feel like that's the best way I can answer because mm -hmm. I don't have like a body of work that I can just, you know, this is what I've done. But you know, <laughs> I've been a body in many other people's bodies of, of work. But I think of that as a body of work because the transformation, I mean, you want to talk about transformation, being able to both inhabit and this is something about interpreters that I think is really essential. And, you know, I think we all know it and it's been discussed, but that idea of embodying one world while maintaining your integrity is a, it's a great practice, you know? And I think what's interesting is that our conversation before this and now is like, you have been, we've been talking about the individual and the collective and how, you know, the, what the choices you make affect a larger world. And so that choice that you make, you know, within other people's work and the way you embody and live in that work of, has a ripple effect. 
you know, and and it's an education for others who see that, you know. So I would never say like you don't have a body of work, right? You know, and it's because it never is just you, because there's everybody who has seen what you do, is watching you, and then the people are watching those people, you know. So it's an interesting question, like how we cross those boundaries, how we think of ourselves within those boundaries. Because I'm totally always saying, oh, well, you know, but but it's an it's like an intellectual exercise to say yes. Everything I do goes out somehow, especially if you're being observed. You know, and what does that? What is the effect of that? You don't know, but it, it, there is an effect. We don't know what that effect is always, but I think it's important to keep in mind. Like, and that relates to this ultimate idea of transformation of society being possible through all of these practices because of that, the way all of these things go. It's a, how smaller system reflect bigger system. It's, when you're in that system, it's a reflection of how we are in society. Whether you make your own world work and you're in a bigger, um, or as a citizen, or as, you know, how do you relate and reflect how your integrity and connection to the larger, and always rechecking one's own involvement and integrity, um, and not going to the side of oh, I'm in the healing or art making, so I'm on this side. We're all uh, constantly struggling every day. How to re integrate and find integrity in this way that um, Daria and Rebecca worded it so beautiful in the composing and decomposing in the um, uh, that happens at all times within somatic practice within our daily livings within our work making and that's such a um, kind of thought that has sustained me through thinking about this and in the last week since the journal has uh, the program has come up for the festival how, to, um, how that becomes a lens that connects everything, that our systems are connected, that, that you're saying, Morgan, of how if we're all the heart and the liver and the, and the organs of a bigger system, when we're sick as an individual or as a society, it affects the whole. And, um, yeah. This idea of um, your own integrity that you're speaking about brushes up against mm -hmm. another concept that we wanted to talk about today, which was about your own values and life choices and how that intersects with your work. I don't know that I'm ready to respond to that question. I was having a thought. You know, as, as you were speaking, and just kind of as the conversation has gone along, I'm aware that in some ways, even as we're talking, I don't know how dropped in we all are. You know, and how much we are actually here as bodies. You know, that you were saying, uh, you were saying early on about what was happening with a dance company and how the ways in which people communicate because there aren't a lot of words, it's much more body to body, that it's reminiscent of what happens in a family. That's really interesting to think about. And we are all always impacting each other's bodies, but we are not in touch with or conscious of it. So then when we start to talk about the relationship of social conditions and how society is sick or traumatic or disturbing, there is a way that, yes, we all are impacted by it and most of us are not aware of it, which allows the impact to have even greater consequences. Um, and so it's just sitting here with this question of what, what even within this circle, within this room does it mean to actually reclaim our connection to our bodies and our lives. Because I wouldn't want us to leave kind of romanticizing the idea that, oh, we make art, we dance, some of us do healing work, some of us do organizing, and everything's gonna be peachy keen because those things are happening. Actually, I mean, the, the, the intensity of sustained awakening and connecting that's required for social transformation without which individual transformation is more enormously limited itself you know it's 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 not easy it's not it's not um it's not just some words it actually is um a pretty daunting task and i suppose at some level i would transition from that to what's personal I mean, that part of why i particularly love this methodology the generative somatics is because of the connections that it is making between the individual and the collective between the body and the mind 
um, between the heart and the spirit and the idea that no one heals in isolation and that in fact social conditions have to be part of what we're also engaging. Um, when you were speaking about life and death too and, and that intersection, to actually choose to be alive means also really be keenly in touch with how much is dying and what is dying and to be able to hold that. And that seems like one of the first places in fact that most of us numb out and then the incredible structures of oppression and capitalism just take advantage of it and keep us as numb as possible. So I don't know what all of that is to say, except that aliveness perhaps is its own reward. What you were saying, Morgan, that the impulse is there. The impulse cannot be kind of squelched or defeated, but we, we do have a choice about responding to it and then choosing to, in some ways, surrender to it and be guided by it. Yeah, and I want to say that this is really the core of the discussion for me. Like, um, to really address that transition between the, the, you know, the individual and the collective is really what interests me because it's the hardest thing. Well, uh, I mean, I think that that is like the idea of the personal life and work kind of connects to that in that, you know, for myself, feeling what you're talking about, that it's never only a personal choice, um, kind of led me to try to investigate methods of using a creative practice to intervene society in, in sometimes in very direct ways. Um, but with a kind of uh, conviction that it has to be, there has to be some sense of imaginative play within that for me and for the world. Like that's a very important impulse to be able to uh, not just act in a didactic way, but find, not, that's also important, but also find ways of connecting again in that in that other realm, you can call it non-verbal, I don't know if that's the right term, but that there's another realm where we connect and we're really good at it as kids and then it kind of falls away again in this culture. I'm sure there are other places where it's less so, but so for me, like the ways I chose to um, practice art, which were like kind of outside of theaters and outside of structures were, it's a very conscious choice because I wanted to see what happens when you do the things that you do in those venues elsewhere. And again, having actually grown up with that kind of practice also, it, you know, where art happened everywhere in my growing up that it didn't seem like an odd choice to me, but, and it was very satisfying because things shifted and changed and people changed. And again, it's a very one-to-one -one kind of, and it's dissatisfying to me, but it's like, you kind of have to do what you do. And, and also um, choosing to do things that are not motivated by profit, almost to a fault. <laughs> Like that's that's a big choice, and it's I don't really feel like it's a choice, but it is a choice, and it it means that you're I mean you're always engaging no matter what with the system, which is the frustrating thing. But like, how do you navigate that? Like every single way, like everything that you're thinking about, everything that you buy, like it's an exercise. Like keep questioning, like to constantly question, which is again exhausting, but it's it's necessary because. You have to, like, you can't stop questioning or else you, I mean, maybe you could get swept away in just the doing what you do, what one does, but I don't even know what one does. Like, it, it, you know, there was no template for me personally, so. You give an example of some of the, the projects that you mentioned that took place outside of theater and um, what you observed, the changes that you observed. Um, well, probably the totemic version of that, I worked with, um, I worked with two people, um, Paul Benny and Alejandra Martorell, and we had a group called Trist, and we did a lot of different interventions in the public space, but like the, what I call our signature piece, it's called Assisted Street Crossing, 
and basically we dress up as city workers. I mean, we don't do it anymore because we're old, but it used to be just us, but now we have other people who are working with us usually. And um, though actually this summer we did it, but anyway, um, we, and we offer people free lifts across the street. And there's like a menu that we show people and it's kind of, it's a direct way to kind of shift what people expect from their everyday encounter and to kind of, and also it's like, will you let me touch you? And like kind of giving a, a very matter of fact, like, oh, it's just a lift across the street. Yep, city service. And you know, it kind of, it's a theatrical trope, but it's, you know, but it's real. And, and the people who give you their weight, I mean, it's intense, right? Like adults who have not been picked up since they were five. <laughs> Big men. I mean, it's very interesting. So, like to me, that that was, the, in a way, the most like direct. Right? So, yeah, the, the video of it is really cute. But um, there's one guy I remember the like, first time we did it in 2004. He's like, he's like a construction worker. Was we were on a street corner for four four weeks in a row, like one day a week. So he, they'd been watching us for a while, and so he and his friend, and so he was like. We took him in the Superman lift, and he was going, Wee! <laughs> So, So that's like, that's, I mean, there are other variations on that, but I feel like that's the kind of thing that it really kind of gets to the heart of some things that I'm interested in addressing. We also, we want to give everybody here opportunity to ask questions or also reflect on these issues in your own work. Um, so please join us. I was also interested, Mariah, because you said you spoke about your personal work for, for dancers, but you have such an experience working across culture, uh, seeing uh, works from you know, Eastern Europe and Africa, which is such an interesting contrast. Um, and um, as you said, you show up with all your experience, you know, yeah. and then you showed up in these places and you, you have witnessed very different ways of approaching those questions in America. So I was also very, you know, I was also something that was, I think, important to bring to the people here because we are so always looking, you know, at America. Sure. And I was really interested to hear, you know, how this question arises in different cultures. Yeah, I think um, I was thinking about that, the question about transformation in my work. And you know, I think as a facilitator, that's another way. A facilitator. I've been developing a program in, with African artists as well. Um, and so I've been able to travel pretty extensively. And, you know, I think you know, when you were talking about the carrying people across the street, it made me think of maybe one of my favorite experiences. Um, this was in Tanzania. And so, you know, the kind of the basis of this work is exchange, you know, so the program I was running between Americans and African artists or Eastern European artists and American artists. And um, I was at this festival and supported some of the projects that were happening there. And, a company from Norway, so it wasn't directly affiliated with the project, but they've been working with um, teaching at a girls' school. And I went to the showing, and it was incredible because you know this was a primary school. They had uniforms. They actually all got their hair cut really short, um, and they had never done any kind of partnering or, or contact and conversation or anything like that. And just to to witness their delight and being able to experience each other in that way, you know, like outside of all the rules of how you're supposed to behave and how we're socialized and being good girls and you know all of those things and just being in their bodies and and you know um, lifting each other and um, you know so I I think that yeah the that itself is transformative. And I think my and our ability to see, you know, on the kind of the macro and the micro of, of how that, that energetic 
exchange happens and how that shifts us and um, intellectual, certainly, which I think often is the primary uh, focus or, or way that, that we come together, but um, that sometimes, yeah, it can be these very simple things. And, you know, in terms of like on a larger, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's like, how do you sum that up? Um, well, let me, like, some of the artists you worked with are very, are activists, like, in a very natural way, which is very different than, you know, the artists here. It seems like it's a really new question that I want to ask you. Yeah. If you feel like there is a much more integrated way for artists in Africa, for example, to address directly social issues and how, you know, how their work is tradition. Also, the question of tradition is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, how do you know how they relate to tradition and contemporary work? How that you know how they transform through that and how do they lead through that um, um, in relation to here? I mean, it could be another subject, but in terms of you know, it's it. I find it very useful when I saw the the the, the two artists at um, Brick. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really. It's palpable. It's so palpable. Yeah, yeah. Who are and it was such, it and was so, you know, such an inspiration. Yeah. Uh, um, what's their name? Um, it was uh, Festin Nanyakula, who's from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Kanaibra Gabriel Kanda, who's from Mozambique. And it was a program of two solos, so they each did a solo on one night um, that uh, Matt International is producing this tour. And yeah, I mean, I think it's so big <laughs> to even talk about it, you know, because the the concept of race is so different in a in a context where black people are the majority in number. It completely changes the conversation, you know, it completely changes the conversation about identity and how art needs to reflect identity or not reflect identity and whose identity and whose voice, you know, it, it's just, it's, it, there's not even, I don't feel like it can make a comparison. For me as a Westerner, an American going there, um, even being black, it was like, it's just completely different to, to feel that and, you know, and be, be inside of that for a moment. Um, you know, so my sense is that it's, things are often more motivated by necessity. I mean, we think that here, like we feel like our conditions are so bad and, you know, the finances, there's no money, 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 money. You know, like, yes, this is a reality we're all living with, but it's a completely different level, you know? So um, the sense of economy and Is that these artists were able to make it immediately and affect into the community? It, it would, it, you know, like when Justin was talking about um, how it was integrating into the community, how it's thinking about the center, how it's evolving, it has an, a transformative effect into the community. He cannot think, you know, in a way otherwise because mm -hmm. of what you said, necessity. Yeah. I think word necessity is very interesting. Um, you know, in, you know, can you describe the effect that these have? Like, I, well, I don't I know these artists' work. So time, but uh, in other words, uh, it was he came back to his country, and um, in, the, in the city where he was, the problem was water. So he decided to work on the water and uh, to, to, to map out where the water was drinkable and not drinkable and to involve people in in that process and that became itself a center where the water tell me if i'm wrong i think you, yeah. yeah but the water was transformed but for that we had to work with everybody mm -hmm. and that place became a, was, became a necessity not to create a company a dance company to then to do dance work but to to create uh, you know a purpose for the necessity of the place and that 
kind of concentration kind of rippled, you know, into into the community and also into other art, African artists that then exchange and you know that so the 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 art is not separate from the necessity of 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 of, of, uh, of people and gender transformation and somatic is integrated in the process itself of the work. Yeah, and, and the economy, you know, and like in, in this, what I hear from, you know, many of the artists that I worked with, so they're, they are choreographers, they had to go to Europe so that they could make money, so they could send money back home, and so it's like the, the typical brain drain, you know, like if you want to work, you have to go to the West, and so then the people who are, you know, the, the cultural activists are no longer where they came from. So then there is a generation of artists who decided to go back home. But if they want to make work, they have to train dancers because there was no there was no contemporary dance, you know. So they started schools, and, and, and that's even loose. They have workshops. They you know do trainings. They do whatever they can do to share their knowledge. And and there's a, a trickle of you know somebody goes to parts and you know learns something. They go back home and then they teach it, <laughs> you know. So the sense of transmission, which I think is another thing that's important with transformation is transmission, you know, sharing resources ultimately is what that means. Um, you know, and, and so but their reality is if they have these workshops, the students want to come, they pay them to come, they pay their travel, their transportation and they give them a stipend because they can't go home and say their parents are like, or their families are like, what did you do all day? Where's, where's the money? Mm -hmm. You know, so, so they're, they actually, Pay them, and it's expected and understood. I mean, not that they're making a whole living off of it. There's not, you know, a lot to go around. But that sense of compensation, and 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 so it, then it's more of that web of like, it's going back into the, into the community and circling back into the art, and you know, in this this way that is cycling. Um, and I don't feel like that is true of art economy. <laughs> not necessarily, but it does happen. Maybe not within the dance world as much, but um, I work with uh, teenagers um, for four years. I had a program and I, and if we did just that for the same reason, and, and it's a common practice for people who are working often with, because they were at risk and low income and like they, they needed money, like either it was either us or McDonald's, and I preferred it to be us. So we created work together, but they were paid as professionals. I mean, again, it wasn't like a living wage, but it was what they would get at McDonald's. So I think that that practice does take place, but maybe within very specific um, areas. And it's really necessary because I did a free, a free class with somebody, and I was like, I don't think this is going to work because we're going to lose a lot of people because they need to be paid. And it happened. Like there was a lot of attrition because it was for like um, under resourced girls and they were like, want to come and, you know, they, I was like, it's not going to work unless we pay them. So, and I think that this is maybe it is a radical idea, but I've encountered it in other people who work with kids who don't have resources and have to work. And I think that you're right, it should be more prevalent because this is our flat mining society. You know, it's, it's like you don't go above your station and it's worse and worse. And so the more we share every resource, and that includes this kind of work, this kind of work is transformational. When I worked with those kids, it was a whole different world at the same time that it was very familiar. You know, it's not that weird, you know, it's, it's part of to like have the permission to be quiet, to have the permission to trust each other was a big deal. It's a big deal for anybody, you know. It's like what Elsa was talking about with her, you know, the goal purpose. Like it's a big deal for anybody, no matter how powerful, to have the permission to be quiet, to have the permission to be present with each other. So I, I think you're right that it's probably more prevalent in a place where there is no choice. But I also feel like this is a place where we have no choice if we actually want things to change. Okay. Well, I was thinking about the question about values, and I agree. I think, I think that there's a lot. Um, you know, Mountain is in a place where 
um, you know, most of the people who live in that area right now live in projects. And, um, you know, the whole question of what your values are is really, it's a really weird thing to be this, like, um, project that part of its basis is on beauty and part of its value is on, you know, food that is sourced sustainably. And part of its value is, you know, healing and to be in this place where a lot of people don't un don't have either the education or the permission to enter, you know, in themselves. And, you know, I, I'm like thinking about chicken today because we have these chickens that are like killed the day they're brought to us and, you know, they're from a few miles away, they're beautiful, and then we rub them with juniper berries and roast them. And, you know, they're just great chickens and we sell them really cheap. And this woman came in today and she wanted to know how much the chicken was, but she didn't want to be taught about the chicken because that's embarrassing to have people teach you. If you're, you're supposed to sort of already know what you're ordering when you go into a place, people don't like to ask questions against this whole thing of like, how much do you educate someone who doesn't, who's scared of not knowing? And then the chicken's too much. And so she walks away. And it's like, that's, you know, that's to me what the problem is, basically in the value of, you know, like, I love this whole conversation of it. Like, it, it's almost, it, it's, uh, I think it's a um, privilege to be able to create a not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. You know, I think for-profit businesses are basically, you know, they're less expensive than, than not-for-profit businesses. Mm -hmm. So that's like a whole thing right yeah. there. And then you go into a for-profit business, basically instead of getting grants, you're using what? Loans or credit cards? I mean, it's an interesting question to me. What, you know, what are your values? What are you in service to if you're creating art or if you're making a business? And especially if you're trying to sustain something. Just one, one piece here. I think it's important to make a distinction um, between uh, like a transformation and work that's um, legible in certain kinds of ways and resourced in certain kinds of ways. The transformation is always existing everywhere. And people's self determination, we're always exercising everywhere. And there's a danger that we run when we, or a sort of a tendency that, 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 that I think we can move close to when we look at um, certain kinds of institutions as the, um, as the um, okay, forms of transformation. Like it, and, and, and this, I see this in every domain. That's like, okay, well, if it, it has a certain kind of legal status or speaks in a certain kind of way or receives certain kind of grants, then it's then it's it gets to be okay, it gets to be and I'm not it's not just about what you're saying, but um, I think in the conversation about transformation, um, as artists, healers, activists, whatever, part of our job is to be uh, really uh, honoring how people are exercising their own self-determination all the time. And this is this is part of what I think uh, is, I struggle with in work that is primarily by individuals, is sometimes a, a, a lack of muscle that we've built in looking at the conditions and, how, and actually looking at how people have survived those conditions in very wise ways. And actually putting our bodies in the place of being in solidarity with people surviving those conditions. Mm -hmm. And so there's a there's a way in which about it when in reality people's anger and sadness is intimately related to the conditions that we're all surviving all the time I'm not sure if I need I want to build on it yeah. more because they be out sitting here also just thinking about among community organizers which is I guess kind of the terrain that I move in the most and one of the 
complaints or, you know, kind of cries in the heart that you'll hear there, you know, they say, oh, if only we could pull people together the way they do the 12 step programs, or if only we could get people the way they, they go to church. There's a reason that those formations and community organizers look with envy at those formations. And I think that in the US, those are really good examples in a certain sense of how people use their own agency and their own values to coalesce, to come together in the community in ways that take care of them. And it's not the same level at which people go off to see theater or dance or go to community meetings to protest the city budget, right? So then, then you say, well, what is happening there? You know, what are the, what, you know, I think that just about everything that's offered inside church, probably movement could figure out, except for the promise of eternal life. The rest of it, though, I mean, you know, the music, the community, the, the all of that, that could be done. I think within what's so, so powerful inside the 12 step movement, when people are really sharing responsibility for each other's um, well being and sobriety and survival, movement could do that as well if it weren't dismissive of human connection and interpersonal process is actually part of what we're trying to include. Similarly with the arts. So it's just kind of, I guess the question for me is, I, I really agree with you, Morgan, about this, the, the tension between those who are focused primarily either on individual self-expression or working with individuals. We, we, we work with folks, the politicized healers, right? What, because many of the folks who come in do one-to-one -one work, but they don't necessarily come with an analysis or a way to engage with collective reality, social reality, and the dynamics of power. And on the other side, so much inside movement, people are not paying attention to actually how critical individual experience is and people's actual coming to terms, actually coming to terms with their trauma, their pain, and their own resourcefulness and resilience. And there's something about resilience that to me feels like the thread that weaves all these pieces together that one of the things we both teach in a course uh, on somatics and trauma. And we spend an entire session just about talking about exploring different forms of resilience, looking at all the research that has looked at individual and collective healing from trauma. Or what is it, what are the factors that make some people less likely to be just totally wiped out because of traumatic experiences? And one of them is creativity and art. That that is one of the things that, you know, across all kinds of cultures, people will turn to as one of the things that restores them having, you know, been traumatized either by social conditions of one kind or another, about apartheid, we can, we can name it, or, you know, natural disasters, tsunamis, hurricanes, etc. What is it that allows people to come back from that and survive? We recently, you know, were in a conversation talking about how we talk about and teach this resilience piece and a little bit that possibly we begin to reify it and to make it into a thing. Because actually what resilience is, is a way of paying attention to your alignments. So whether you're an actor or a dancer or a performer, part of what you're conveying is a relationship to aliveness. Part of what one is receiving in that is a relationship to aliveness. And this, then the question I think has become, and how do we scale it? How do we make it not so much one-to-one, -one, but more to community and collectivity? Do you have any questions? Um, I have a question actually for Oh, yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important way to do that. Is this when I hear you talk about 12 staff or church, I mean, what's there is an element of spirit. It's an element of something that's greater than a, than a human individual. And it's, it's something that the collective from all walks of life, we all, whether or not we speak to it, have our awareness there, it's something that does bring us. I want to honor um, the, the work that these donors do by Zoram um, and their many people that are in this room and Jesse who introduced us to Zoram because I think that um, that teaching yesterday was uh, an incredible teaching about 
the resilience and how to work um, in resilience and how the, you know, the, our mission in a way is to, that's all the only thing we're working with. And the faith, you know, that, um, I mean, I, I, Every single day you wake up, and that's the mission. And to find the life, you know, to work with it, and to have the faith that every day you do a little bit more, and you work with a little bit more people, and 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 the threads are even stronger. That's it. Can look like it's magic, but it's, it's really the work. It's, it's an amazing thing. It's a little abstract, I'm sorry, but I'm just like... Does anybody have other thoughts or questions? It'd be great to hear from you because we've been talking a lot. Yeah. Just speaking for myself. I don't know, I've just been thinking about the thing that you... Uh, just? No. Justine. Justine, yeah, thanks. Um, education is so problematic, and I'm an educator. I just came from teaching in the Bronx and, and, mm -hmm. and in Brooklyn all day, like uh, children's in school and after school programs, and, and like often in communities um, that are much different than my background. Um, and it's like it's a constant question of like how do you how do you meet, and how do you how do you find uh, how do you find like what you can offer to the community? Like for um, what I don't know what can serve them, but it's often like uh, I don't know. I remember it was in this one of the first teaching artist things that I had like last year was a uh, uh, parent workshop where I was going to like eat Brooklyn, and I was teaching a healthy cooking workshop to. Um, a, a bunch of women of color who expressed that they were very poor and all on food stamps and it was just so messed up it was like here's this white guy coming in and like telling you how you should cook and it's just like <laughs> no it's a problem right? yeah how do you have resonance how do you teach a counter person Res spirit level resonance with somebody who walks in the door so that they don't feel oppressed. And even if that counter person lives in the, the projects, he still is so excited about this thing that he's standing taller than the person who's coming in. It's like, how do you how do you meet people without I mean I know it sounds like chicken, but it to me it's a big deal. Like I watched this introduction and it's like but I think that's the level that our values are. That's, you know, like witnessing that and asking that question. It's so mm -hmm. deeply sad. Like, like, could we cut that chicken up for you so that you could have, I want to give the chicken away. Now, like, what do you do to pay for the chicken and to have somebody eat it, you know, that actually wanted the chicken? Like, it's a, to me, that's like, that's the performance I'm in. Yeah. I think the very important thing is don't feel sorry for people because you're not better than them. No, you're not, not more fortunate even. I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm not saying that. I'm not, no, but I'm saying that there is a kind of dynamic that happens where it feels asymmetric, but it's not. And no, you know, it is asymmetric. It I'm is, holding course, an expensive but, chicken that somebody wanted to eat. It's a real thing. I mean, I understand that it's like, you know, it. it it may seem like it, yeah, I, I agree. You don't want to feel like you're in this uh, privileged place. And these people, I don't want to walk around feeling sorry for the people I'm serving. You know, we're in service, but you know, it, it's like if somebody comes in the door with acupuncture, if somebody comes to a performance, you don't want to feel sorry for your audience. You don't want to feel mm -hmm. sorry for the person who is sitting in your acupuncture treatment. You don't, you know, you, that's not, I'm not talking about feeling sorry. I'm talking about, something being missed. But you say, you say, for example,
like, it is asymmetric, you're right, it's good to acknowledge privilege, mm -hmm. but I also think that there's something you all have to offer each other. And oh, certainly. Right, so it's like, like it's okay. It's energy, energy will not survive. Right, there. exactly. So you, there's an energy exchange that you learn. <laughs> and the same thing that the viewer is saying, like, there's an energy exchange, and you learn from each other. And you can acknowledge the different kinds of privilege, because you don't know what other kind of privilege she may have, that, you know. Oh, you know. oh definitely. So I, yes. that's all I'm saying. It's like, I don't want to like say, oh, I'm no, sorry, but just like that there's ways of kind of negotiating one for one, especially actually in retail. Or in the teaching of a comment over here. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, or in the, in terms of, you know, I'm assuming that you know, like you said also, it's so easy to get into a role. Mm -hmm. It takes us out of the fact that we are all just going to be the guy who has to get into this. And this is the person who's no, that is not the way it works. And this is the parent, and this is the child. Like, the child is teaching the parent, and the student is teaching the teacher. And, and I feel like that, that's what I'm hearing, is that that's actually the reality. And we get into these roles, we try to uh, create some sort of structure so we can just, you know, walk through it. But Provide the structure for an exchange, and the exchange is what you're doing. Is I would say yes and no, actually, to that. I mean, I really hear you in a piece that has to do with the kind of fundamental alignments that we all have in common. And at the same time, we are all products of conditions. And we deeply internalize those conditions um, so that the structures that are in society are also in our flesh. You know, we're here, we're talking about somatics and the body and becoming aware. And again, you know, the lineage that we work in, part of what we try to wake up to is how social systems are in our bodies. Um, not only, in other words, whatever our individual experience may be, you know, but if you grow up inside patriarchy, then you're going to have certain ways of what you think masculinity is and what men are entitled to and what femaleness is, femininity, if you grow up inside white supremacy, and for now, I am limiting my comments to those growing up in the US. But wherever you fall on that scale, you will have internalized ways of moving in the world, where it's okay for you to walk, where it's not okay for you to walk. You know, when we start to talk about heterosexism, I mean, there, there are um, processes that, that, you know, that we have used with people to actually, you know, if, if everybody's coupled off and some people are, you know, pretending to be straight couples and some people are, um, homosexual couples, all the straight couples walk through the gay couples and split them apart <laughs> because that's what the social reality does. <laughs> Approval, permission, et cetera, supports one way, one, some people connecting and not others. We're living in that. I mean, I think of a friend, nothing to do with somatics, just a dear friend of mine who used to ride what they call the daddy train. That's a train that goes back and forth between Fairfield County and Grand Central, right? Because she was a lawyer and that was what she did. But she talked about how Nobody would ever move out of her way. She's a tall black woman. She's taller than I am. She made a decision that she was going to stop moving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what would happen is white men would walk into her. Like, Where'd you come from? This is a tall, striking I didn't black see woman. You. Yeah, I didn't see you. Where'd you yeah. come from? That's because we've internalized social systems. I think that some of what you're describing, what you're describing with the teaching, we begin to sit in the pain of contradiction. Contradiction is real, and it's another place that probably most of us prefer to be asleep or numb, because in part, lots of the contradictions we sit in, we can't do anything about. To the extent that we're sitting here in inexpensive clothing, there are children in the world who are suffering, right? So it's like to, to be awake to the contradictions as well as to what we embody seems to me in and of itself a magnificent calling that will alter how we show up in our interactions, in our art, in our creations. But any place where we 
pull back from that because it's painful is another place that we will continue to reinforce it. And I'm not suggesting that there's a pulling back. I'm suggesting how can we embrace it and also embrace the humanity that we all want at the same time. Are there other questions? I felt like there was two questions. Yeah, I had a response to this. It was just kind of, but now I'm like considering. I don't, I don't know. I guess it was just about like um, resources and where resources come into play. Because in nothing about that experience was uh, me feeling bad for, for them. It was, um, it's, it's sort of like, caught myself in that situation being so um, overwhelmed by the problem of the resources like that that are this like structural issue in that situation and then and then you know I guess you know education is a resource but but education is now about resources it's all about capital and you're restricted up uh, you're restricted from education based on your resources and of course that has everything to do with you know who you are and who you happen to be in this in this highly whatever hierarchical world and um but yeah sometimes it's like sometimes it's just so overwhelming like what, what are you supposed to do in that situation besides i don't know make a smoothie and talk about <laughs> how good it tastes and like you're like, I guess we can buy rice and beans. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, then I, I feel like it's also about proximity and relation, right? That part of the muscles you were talking about, different kinds of muscle building as a metaphor for um, the very interpersonal and the deeper level of um, humanity and of our practices together, but also the structure of um, coming together, being in proximity to each other, which New York in a way, the whole is an example of it as it doesn't work and as it's segregated, but also as we have to sit next to each other, there is possibility of proximity and just to bear together and to be in proximity. I'm also teaching a class in the Bronx um, of older women of all races and colors between 60 and 80. And here I am, but, but I walk in there um, and just by the sheer relation of me being there and us relating, me making space to listen, me making space to relating in different ways, touching each other, laughing, feeling funny, feeling good, exploring different ways. I feel that um, to give a structure and possibility of proximity in order to um, apply ourselves as relational being um, in a way encompasses that um, many of these layers that are very interpersonal, energetic, but also social. And how can we create structures that allow us to come together and be in proximity other than the big state of New York, but something more concrete in our different fields or interests. And I'm trying to figure it out for myself personally, and there's already a lot happening there. We have time for about one more. Yeah, I would just like to ask for some resources from you all, because um, I feel very emotional about this topic, and I'm probably going to cry because um, what to do when you wake up and there is the impulse, there is the desire, and you walk down the stairs, and um, there's always a lot of finding. I mean, I'm curious about the nine to five of embodiment. And if you wake up and you see that that's my job, like, that's my job, I want that to be my job. Um, there's, I'm frustrated because I feel like actually I can't practice my job. And um, the practice is showing up to Melanie's Qigong class at 10 in the morning. Um, and I just moved to New York like two months ago, so this is probably like part of that. <laughs> <laughs> but that aside, I'm um, trying to, try to formulate the process and that relentless, okay, who's doing the work? Where are the resources? It's that constant digging of like to the root, to the root, to the root. And um, I don't feel inspired by the city. I don't trust the city yet. And so it's kind of this, 
it is this push and nudge of like, I don't want to, um, I just want to go towards that thing, and I don't know what it is. But I know it when people talk about it, and I know it when they go to a workshop and meet a Martin, and it's like, what's that thing? And um, being uh, 23, trying to, like really trying to find words to put it together so you can keep asking questions on it, um, is where I'm at, and <laughs> I just feel like uh, this is the place to like ask you who are doing the work and who are in the bread and butter and meat of those questions. Um, what is your nine to five? Where would you go? Because um, it still feels like an isolated pursuit mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. So that's my question. Yeah. <laughs> First sure. mm -hmm. When you find out, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have something to contribute to that. The um, Give Me Dance, where We Are Being Hosted, has a second location um, down on Chamber Street by City Hall. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there is a center there called the Community Action Hub, which just recently opened. And it's a center for um, connecting dance artists with um, social action practices, um, and it's grown out of Give Me Dance's own work with survivors of domestic violence, um, which is something they've been doing for 15 years now. Um, but the idea of the hub is to connect um, artists who share these interests um, and they offer like workshops, there's an exercise exchange where people who work in educational or clinical contexts can share exercises with their peers before trying them in the context that they work um, in. Um, there's like informal meet and greets with leaders in the field that all just started and it's going to be developing and will certainly be shaped by the people who participate. So that's one a place that will strive to be a resource for like-minded artists to like meet and share resources and build community. So there's one idea. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Generative somatics stuff, or you can talk to either of their eye afterwards about that too. And I, I also do. I know I mentioned it a few times. I just want to keep a push for. Um, Social movements are where we where we can keep embodying ourselves and keep waking up. And you know, right now there's the um, responses to the non-indictment of Darren Wilson, also the grand jury um, findings about um, Eric Garner's case here in New York City are going to be coming out in the next um, in, the, in the weeks to come. And so, I just want to say, like, these are it's everywhere. I mean, like, this is really the river. We can connect into our river everywhere. You know, there's nowhere it's not. Um, so just to just to give a plug for putting our bodies in the streets. And this is an incredible thing to do personally. That many people still do it, that they send buses or uh, to person to for the somatic practitioner. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean that was an incredible thank you for this amazing to bring that. So they're really I find that the work you're doing is really I also think, you know, the way we live, it's important to invent your own, you know? It's okay. You don't have to, like, make it happen, but just what are your, what, what moves you and what would you do with that if you could? And you can. Like, everything I do, I made up. I mean, of course, with incredible support from the huge community, but it's like you have an idea, people connect to it, it happens. You know, I feel like everybody sitting here does that. Everybody sitting there does that. You know, it's so it's okay to like originate within yourself as well, because that comes from everything that has already influenced you anyway. So you're just a conduit. The way you are when you're dancing, you know, to me, you're just a conduit on a lot of levels. And and that conduit can go many places. So yes, it's important to find other resources. Like, like you have thoughts of your own, but how does that? That's what I need to make that happen. It's also, you know, it's just like it's part of the of the mediation of information. It's like if you hear and you have exactly that this, so you can have a vector of that. 
expensive processes that will come to vectoring possibility and giving vector the possibility, like the fact that you're here, you know, is such an incredible thing. It's like that, uh, that the fact that, uh, so we are, we are vectors of, of, we are channeling possibilities and we forget. And, uh, and I know that's how I can survive that, you know, the acknowledgement that we can um, channel possibility for each other is like, you know, a very, it's good, it's not about you. So, I mean, not, it is not you too. <laughs> <laughs> don't be in such a hurry. Well, I'm, I'm just really, I'm sorry to do it sorry. in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should just announce the bit over here. I just have so much gratitude to you for expressing that because to me, that really is what, I mean, it's really what I'm here for. And to me, it's what it's what this panel is. And so hearing that sound of your voice and, and looking, you're not even looking for that thing. You definitely can't sense it. You're not looking for it. Maybe you're waiting for that thing. But it just gives me a little bit of hope. And I think, you know, we could talk to you. <laughs> it's I really just want to thank you. Because um, you're just not alive. All of us, I mean, and it's like a sad. What other question about in don't hurry? Yeah, we just thank others. But I'm curious, I'm curious. Go to the library. It is a question for me how to honor time as a process and being alive as a process when the the impulse is just immediate and the conditions feel so immediate. So how you how you you know are in that and then also like yeah but, but like you yeah. everyone does their own thing. Yeah. How do you everything helps a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I mean it's great. It's important to I think that we're all it, we probably wouldn't be sitting together in this room if we weren't like oh, had that, that, you know. And I think when you first feel it it's it's so it's like a panic attack, you know, and but it's okay, you know, and I feel like we can all say that to each other, like, it's okay, take breath, and then move on, you know, and so and I think that, that if we didn't do that, we couldn't do it, you know, we, like, we couldn't practice, do the crazy things, like, we just, you know, started a business, that's the craziest thing we used to do. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, and it's like, breathe, no, breathe, 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 you know, like, the panic of those kinds of things, but it never goes away, right? But I think that it's really like how we kind of bring together and try to offer support in whatever way we can to each other feeds us. So just offering support to someone else actually will feed you. You know what I mean? So that might be one way. Go offer support to somebody and see what happens. You may hate it. I mean, I also, for hurry and urgency, I think urgency is hurry, I think it's dissatisfaction, it's totally necessary force. Um, yeah. Paired with trust and listening, urgency and mm -hmm. and, and um, dissatisfaction. Yeah, dissatisfaction is really good. Yeah, dissatisfaction is like death, like death and bad. <laughs> I was going to say, it, yeah. Never get too comfortable. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have 23 year olds and they like to pretend they're five now. <laughs> And they're really excited about being five and in kindergarten. And the energy that I think, like my experience of what Sarah said, was just that that you know, just being Sarah is that they're like the gift of that energy, like the freshness of somebody who just moved to New York and is excited about <laughs> finding something new, is a gift to everybody in this room. Yeah, because you know, many people have just layers of darkness over them. I was thinking of it, it's like the current, you know, the switch is on. That's amazing. Harness that, channel it. And you're going to do things and you're going to make mistakes. I know I do. And then I like 
regrouped and they get, you know, like they try to find the current or another one. And, and you know, I guess all I can say is just take what's useful because there's going to be a lot in the mix, always. You know, like I, I, every day I'm like, I feel like I'm <laughs> wading through it, but then something resonates. And then you go, oh, and you follow that, you know, for a little while, and then it takes you someplace. It's, you're going to end up someplace you never thought you would be. I mean, that's, I'm just saying, that's what happened with me. You know, like that's how I'm sitting here today with people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so. I think that the switch is always a great place to end. <laughs> <laughs> Much better than lawyers with dark <laughs> To... Oh, okay. So I know Alta needs to um, catch the elevator. So and we have to begin today with a semantic activity all together. We're going to end, which is by singing to Alta. Oh, yeah. Birthday it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> let's do let's do the Stevie Wonder version. You know it. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy suffering um, being taken in vain and um, this is something I came across uh, uh, by uh, Abdul Baha and the Baha'i faith recently this is just a passage of it I'm just going to share um, in regards to suffering does the soul progress more through sorrow or through the joy in this world the mind and spirit of human advance when they are tried by suffering. The mind and spirit of human advance when they are tried by suffering. The more the ground is plowed, the better the seed will grow. The better the harvest will be. Just as the plow furrows the earth deeply, purifying it of weeds and thistles, so suffering and tribulation free human from the petty affairs of this worldly life until they arrive at a state of complete detachment. Their attitude in this world will be that of divine happiness. Human is, so to speak, unripe. The heat of the fire of suffering will mature them. Look back at the times and past, and you will find that the greatest human have suffered most. Uh, I could share with you the link of this if you want, but that's just you know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Happy birthday. <laughs> 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 yeah, <I'm something>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.